Used to be cool. 7,000 people here uh, when the gold was running. Seven pubs in its heyday. And this is it, the last one. Some people know Mika Thera. Some people you say the name and they go, wait, what? Where? You do get a bit forgotten about here. A town of 400 people, there's no votes. You know, and that's what it all boils down to. They'll never build a railway line here or they'll never build a new bridge here, so we're not Metro. We get excited if we get things like curbing or a public toilet or a bus shelter. It's special to us because we haven't had them. I wouldn't know the last time I've seen a shearer. I think the bush is a dying breed. The Murchison region is known for its rich mineral deposits and pastoral history, as well as its unique arid environment. It's a sparsely populated area, located in the mid-northern part of WA, about 700 kilometres north of Perth. Towns like Mekithara, Kew, Mount Magnet and Yeogu were all born out of the gold rush in the late 1800s. These towns live on, but not all gold rush towns survived. Towns like Day Dawn and Big Bell once thrived, but now a ghost marked on a map. By the 1930s, after many ups and many downs, Big Bell was thriving. Even as recently as 1950, the town had a population of nearly a thousand. A hospital, a school, a theatre, a post office, an airport and a railway station. Yeah, you may, may, imagine five or six hundred men in the bar, all rigging bed. And this oh, yeah. ladies too. And ladies too, yeah, yeah. Oh, there used to be some great goings on here of a fine night. Established in 1936, Big Bell was gazetted to support the Big Bell Mine, which operated nearby. But in 1955, the mine had finished up, and so too did the town. A hundred kilometres down the road from where Big Bell once lived, sits the town of Mount Magnet. Kent Lucy has been operating his butcher shop there for over 20 years. We come to a bit of a handshake agreement over half a dozen beers and bought it. Then can't get rid of me, I'm stuck here now. <laughs> you do stupid hours, you get up when it's dark, you get home when it's dark, but you have the coldest beer in town <laughs> and the best barbecues. You got the best skies at night, you got the best days during the day. And if you like going out the bush and looking around and history everywhere, it's yeah, bloody good fun here. Mount Magnet has a population of 450 people. Kent not only serves the local township, but also the tourists in the cooler months. He says finding staff to help him run the shop has always been tricky. Trying to get people into outer blocks, the out blocks, whatever you want to call it, outback, is hard. People don't want to come here. A lot of, especially the young ones, there's no takeaways, no nightclubs. I have tried to get other butchers to help out, but um, it's never sort of worked too good. Kent says he is the last remaining butcher in the Murchison. I'm the best looking one for 500 miles. <laughs> I haven't had a holiday, you know, I can't remember when probably be well over 10 years ago. Um, why do I do it? I am mad. I do enjoy making stuff. I make a lot of naggers and small blizzards. I do enjoy that. Because you can make something out of nothing. And you can make any sort of flavour you can think of. But I do wake up lately thinking I am mad. <laughs> Maybe I should go back to bed, but yeah, the body clock's now. Yeah, you wake up at three o'clock every morning, no matter what, so you might as well just get up and go to work. <laughs> I can't do it forever. Um, I can, but my body can't. I'm falling apart now. Um, I do have troubles with me. Yeah, you walk on concrete all your life, so obviously you get knee and ankle problems and all the like. The future is, I do not know. I have no escape plan at the moment. It's just keep working. Keep working until I either fall in a hole or, um, or um, someone else takes it over, I suppose. Yeah. In the meantime, keep 
keep working. <laughs> 80 kilometres north of Mount Magnet lies the town of Kew, once a major hub with a population of 10,000. Now has about 120 residents. Joyce Ramsey runs the Queen of the Murchison Guest House. We'd come off a cattle station and uh, not very much money to be made on a small station and people laugh, especially when they're from the eastern states or Europe. That was 330,000 acres or 150,000 hectares. It's just not enough, and so it was tough. And we, we bought this with um, what we had left, and uh, it's been a great experience, great experience for me anyway. There's no reason why my guests can't be comfortable just because it's an outback town. I mean, things don't need to be broken down. They can be you know, replenished and renewed, and no reason why they shouldn't be comfortable and have modern facilities. Six months of the year, we get all sorts of um, Prospectors that come here, they fill up the caravan park and they go out with their uh, detectors and they think they're going to find this uh, nugget. Some of them do, they find small nuggets, but the big ones have long gone. Uh, but hope springs eternal in the breast of a uh, prospector. Joyce says the gap between the city and country life has widened over the years, which can make it hard for people to understand what actually happens in the bush. Fewer people have a connection to the country. Even when I came here, and my family came here in 58, uh, everyone had a connection to a farm. It had an uncle or a granddad, or someone had a farm that they could go and visit some of the school holidays. So that they, they saw how hard it was to work, and they, they did it. They helped on the farm, you know, hay bales and all that sort of thing. So they knew they had a connection with the, the land, which they don't have now. You know, children will argue with you that milk actually comes from cows. No, no, it comes in a carton in the shop. No, mate, no. I'd like to stay on. I'm enjoying my time here, but um, last August I had a, a knee replaced and it hasn't turned out the way I wanted to. Uh, very disappointing. So because I'm not able to maintain the same high standards of cleanliness and busyness that I, I wanted, um, I think it's time to pass the baton on to someone else. Um, I've worked since I was 14, so it's time for me to have a bit of a rest, do the things that I enjoy, and um, fill my life with other good things. 115 kilometres northeast of Kew lies Mekithara, a town of 700 people. When Landline visited, Amy Dickens was running the local bakery. Basically, during COVID days, rental crisis, in Perth, being stuck in a job that you didn't enjoy. A lot of things were pointing at leaving Perth and moving to a small town like Mekithara. So while the kids were young, we thought to give it a go and here we are. Every day is different. Typically, average uh, on an average, I would start anywhere between midnight and four o'clock in the morning and I would be here throughout the day until four o'clock in the afternoon. I then go home and spend a couple hours with the kids, have dinner and put them to bed. Um, and then a lot of time I'm coming back here and doing prep in the evening, just making my life a little bit easier for the next day. Amy also had similar trouble finding good staff and the town finds it hard to grow with nearby fly-in, fly-out mining operations. You know, because it is a gold town, it started off with the locals and now everything is FIFO. So you get these people, they come into town, they work, they leave. They don't spend very much money here. They don't add to the town's economy. They come, they make their money, they go. Whereas if you're a local, you work, you pay your taxes or your rates, you go shopping at the local grocery store, you're putting some money back into that town and that's not happening very much anymore. It's, it's leaving the town, which is sad. So yeah, it would definitely be beneficial for the town, for the population to grow, and the town can grow with it. Things like daycare is such an essential, and if we had a higher population with parents that needed daycare, they would then supply that, which would be more workers. You know, it's, it's um domino effect, I suppose. Since Landline left, Amy was forced to shut down her business. It was too hard to continue, 
but she's found other local work. Down the road, 350 kilometres southwest, lies Yaogu. Once a population of 7,000, today it's around 120. Stan Willock owns the last remaining pub, but has had it up for sale for the last three years. I was a young bloke that had a dream of owning his own pub. We come up here and had a look. I was going to have a partner and he couldn't raise the money. I bought it and I've had it ever since. It's uh, not a bad place to sit behind the bar and talk to travellers and spin them a bit of bullshit and tell them, <laughs> tell them about the area, you know. I've had five backpackers were coming here and uh, were supposed to be here on certain dates and never turned up. I think there's too many other opportunities before they get to the bush. Yeah, people just don't want to leave the cities. I mean, the mining is not doing a great deal for us. They've got their own camps and uh, and they uh, police them pretty tight. Don't let them off the reservations, you know. It's um, pretty tightly run ships. I don't know how these places are going to survive in the long run. <laughs> We're a dying breed. Well, I'm a dying breed anyway. I'm getting to the end of the line. It's, uh, yeah. I'd like to be another 30 years younger, but, uh, eh, that won't happen. Stan says if he can't sell his pub, he will eventually have to walk away. If the pub shuts, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't hold up much hope for a lot of these places up this way. I mean, people is what makes these places go round and people should come out and, and experience this. There's some magnificent country out here. It's still got its own story to tell.